We've all been on load in and it's around lunchtime. It's getting close to tune and we're having a conversation. Then we get blasted with this. That's not fun for anyone, right? But people insist that we need to run this pink noise signal at crazy hot levels so they can tune properly. And I, I'm not quite sure that's the case. So we're going to assess like, well, why do we use pink noise? And why does it have to be that darn loud or actually does it to make sure we are tuning properly? This is going to go back to some fundamentals and how we actually measure systems and excited to share that with you today. First, we're going to demonstrate what our biggest ally is and making sure we have good data in our software. Then we're going to jump here to our measurement setup and run a few tests and see what this looks like in the real world environment. A speaker with a microphone in a room. We're actually going to take this other speaker here, feed it a different source, intentionally cloud our data with noise and see how much do we actually have to be above the noise floor to get good data. And I think you'll be surprised by the results. All right, so let's jump right in. Let's first unpack some underlying principles of measurement, and then we'll extrapolate those to a test environment right here where we'll be able to see just how loud we need to get our pink source levels to be. Is does this need to be a prescribed actual SPL level? Does it need to be relevant to some other data type? And we're gonna cover all of that today. So first up, why in the world do we use pink noise as a common measurement signal? So we're measuring sound systems with the frequency range of hopefully what the human hearing range is, and that's 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000 hertz. Not many subwoofers can get that low, but we are looking to be able to have that amount of frequency information reproduced by our sound systems. So if we want to measure the entire range of our sound system, it makes sense to have a signal source that is the same. So pink noise is able to excite every frequency very quickly, almost all at once over the entire frequency range that we give it. So from 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000 hertz. So if we're trying to look at data across the entire range of our speaker, we could use a source that is just, uh, I don't know, like a trumpet solo or something like that, which has a lot of high frequencies, but then we wouldn't be able to see information in our sub range. So pink noise is exciting all frequencies really fast. So we're able to see the entire range of our speaker all at once. We could just the same use white noise or even a music track that has very dense and very full range, but it might have dropouts, there's transit levels, it's gonna change. So all that to say, pink noise is very stable, it's easy to generate, and we know for sure it's going to excite the full range. So that's why we use that source. White noise is used more commonly in electronic measurement for a few reasons I'm not going to go into today, but pink noise sounds flat to our human ears and is equal energy per octave versus white noise, which is every single frequency at equal energy. And since we double in the amount of frequencies per octave, since it's a logarithmic scale, it gets brighter and brighter because we have a proportionally more amount of frequency content per octave as we go up. So pink noise accounts for that, levels it off, and it sounds flat to our human ears. So that's why we use pink noise. So then we have to think about, look, how loud do we need to run it to get a good measurement? And that all comes down to coherence. Coherence is a quality indicator of our data. So uh, we obviously we need good insights or data that we can trust to make any decision. Just like if you're trying to invest in the stock market and someone's telling you the wrong thing about what Apple or Walmart is doing, then you're not going to make good decisions. So coherence can tell us how certain it is that the data that you're seeing within your audio analyzer of choice is is can be trusted to make the decision that you're going after. So we're going to look at Smart V9 today and look at how it shows shows us coherence, uh, extrapolate a few things about what makes good and bad coherence, and then run our experiment here in the studio to see how noise affects that data. Because again, we're trying to extrapolate the signal, the thing we're worried about from the noise. Noise is a constant part of our environment, but how much of it should we worry about is going to be the root question that we're going to be addressing today. I'm in Spark here, and I've got two transfer functions set up. So that's a new term from you. As opposed to spectrum view, I can look at what my microphone here next to me is doing, and it's picking up my voice, it's picking up the background noise, and it's just showing the signal as is. Like, hey, what does this signal look like if we break apart that waveform wave and show it to us 
over frequency. So this can give us a good idea of what the tonality of our system is or what the mix is doing at mix position. But transfer function it is taking a reference signal and then comparing it against what is happening in my measurement loop. So always have measurement and reference as the two things that you need. And again, coherence tells us, mm, can I trust this data about what the difference is between my measurement and reference? Because that's what you care about, right? We're sending a signal looped back in, in this case, pink noise, and it's saying, hey, um, is there a lot of noise that's clouding my ability as the algorithm is going to be able to tell is this data can be trusted? So let's see what look like good coherence looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and send pink noise out of my signal generator to an EQ. And we can see here this red line here in SMART. If it's closer to the top of the graph, it means I have really good coherence. I can trust this data. As it drops down, it means bad data. Or as or it's basically, I don't know if this is signal or it's noise. So at the top, if we hover our mouse over here, I can see at 679 hertz, so looking here at the top of the screen when I move my, back, my mouse back down, it's at 99% coherence. So it's really sure that I can trust this data. But as we move up in frequency with this measurement that's a uh, spoiler, it's not set up right, it drops. So this is only 14% sure. So if it's at 50%, it means it's half signal, half noise. So we want our measurements to be on the upper end, right? Because we want to have a lot of signal to it. So we'll talk about what clouds signal or increases noise a little bit later. But first up, we need to sync up our measurements. So right here, I have a measurement or a delay offset we can add to sync it up. Because if our measurement loop is looking at two different chunks of the waveform, then we're comparing apples and uh, Ferraris, right? We need to compare apples to apples. So in, in V9, I can hit the D key, and it's going to find that peak in the impulse response up here and sync everything up. So now this data looks a lot better. We see across the entire frequency spectrum, our coherence is all the way at the top. It's at 99%. So this is a very low noise environment, meaning I can really, really trust this data. The face trace is almost flat, and the only reason it's not completely flat is that I'm using a digital loop back, and there's the ADD converter and all this stuff. I'm not worried about it, but our impulse response is nice and sharp. This is all pointing towards really good data. So now let's do a really clean transfer function measurement and measure what this EQ is doing. I'm actually running it out into a separate audio interface and using the built-in EQ in this guy. So let me do a 6 dB dip, or actually 10 dB dip, at a Q of 0.7 at 1K. Now it's showing me that here in SMART. It's showing me the change in the phase relationship, the change in the impulse response, and the change in the magnitude. So it's showing me this. So is the actual EQ doing what I said it did? Let me go down to 1K at the top. It shows me, yeah, we're down 10 dB. That, this did exactly what we thought it was going to do. And that's here. The graphs look a bit different. This one's compressed. But me showing over here, yeah, that's what happened. So the fact that there's a difference doesn't mean it's bad data. It just, you can, the coherence line's still very much at the top, but it, uh, we, it says you can really trust this data. So let me move this out of the way. And now I'm going to change it kind of quickly. And you'll see the coherence line uh, move because this now data point is moving around. So I'm moving the EQ boost up and down. So it's like, hey, whoa, 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 this data was a lot different. It was just a couple of frames or bins ago, and it's changing. But once I stopped, it's settled in. It's gotten several data points because it's measuring 24 times per second. At least it isn't smart. And it's saying, hey, this is, this is good. This is fine. It's able to latch onto it. I can change the averaging depth up here. I can have it be much more responsive if I want, which is usually the case in electronic measurement. So you see how it's, it's a lot snappier and goes choop, choop, snaps right to it. But let me make the averaging depth really long and make a very quick change. And it's gonna take a long time to get there because it's having to take a lot of data and cycle through it. The coherence is like, what in the world is happening right now? And as it gets to the final gain change, let me make it uh, closer to where it is. I can also hit V to flush the average or have it start over. Ah, now we've settled in. So this is good coherence. And it's good coherence because it's an electronic measurement. There's very low noise. It's very sure of what's happening. All right. So now let's talk about what makes 
bad coherence. So the first thing here we had is I had to use my measurement delay to sync everything up. So let me go ahead and unsync it. I'm gonna undo this EQ change, make it nice and snappy. And I'm gonna add 20 milliseconds of <laughs> delay here. And it's it doesn't know which way is up now. Let me increase the averaging a little bit here. Since it's not looking at the same chunk of the waveform, it's try, again trying to compare apples to Ferraris in it's like, I don't know, you can see here in the high frequencies that <laughs> the coherence is at 0%. It's like, this is so not the same thing right now, I cannot tell you. But we actually have a lower frequencies, it's able to tell, and this is uh, because we actually have a multi-time window going on, something for another later video to unpack some of that. But if you see this stair step drop in coherence or just a, a overall very low coherence, first thing you need to do is check your measurement setup. Is everything routed correctly? Is it able to come in and uh, it just, are your cables good? So make sure you just don't have a bad measurement setup. The second cause in a drop of coherence is poor signal to noise ratio. So if I get our measurement synced back up here, there's again, very low noise in this electronic measurement because it's a cable running into an EQ and back in. There's not opportunity for more noise to be introduced. And what we're gonna discover is like, well, how much noise can actually ruin a measurement? And I think you might be surprised. So how can you solve this? You can either turn up the measurement level, get over the noise or turn down the noise. So the, the more signal to noise ratio we have, the more sure we're gonna have of our measurement. And lastly, it's poor direct to reverberant ratio. So this is usually you folks in the field are seeing in your measurement, like all these spikes and drops of coherence are getting worried. And well, do we actually have control over this? So here are four measurements front to back, my typical ABCD approach I did, I show in a, uh, in Mercy Fort Smith, and this was a big arena. And you can say like, this coherence doesn't look really great at all. <laughs> you see it, it uh, if I look here at, 544 hertz, it's 1%. Eee, that's, that's pretty low. So this microphone's all the way at the back of the room. Again, a big reverberant arena, hard surfaces, lots of reflections. But as I move forward, so green moving forward to orange, we see that move up some. And then to green, and then to pink, a lot, especially in the mid range, it gets higher up. And then I have yellow. We see here on the top end, especially, it's a lot closer. The coherence is very high. So we're de dealing with floor bounces, the reverb of the room. So in a bad room, this is pretty typical coherence. I obviously made sure my measurement stuff gear was working and it's gave me some workable data, but uh, don't be surprised in a very reverberant space, this is what you're seeing. So those sharp drops and peaks and sharp rises is usually due to floor bounces and comb filters because you're seeing actually cancellation in the signal. So the only thing that's left is noise and you're seeing an addition of energy. So it's actually giving more signal above the noise as the comb filter is moving up. So it gives you high coherence. So that's working against you. You have the room reflections. So consider this data worst case scenario. And um, so just make sure you're synced up. I can still see here that my impulse response is locked on. I did my timing right, but don't see, be surprised if it looks this messy. So what you can do, you can see I can decrease the reverb direct, uh, increase the direct to reverberant ratio by getting closer to the source. So this is the same thing of when you might be on a show and think like, oh, hey, my main speakers are loud enough or have a good enough range ratio to get all the way to the back. But if the room's very reverberate, you might just need to add delays to increase coherence or intelligibility at the back. More high frequency content closer to people so they can understand it. So if you've ever been at a big concert hall and someone tries to talk to you from on stage, it's hard to hear since you're hearing so much of their voice swimming around versus if someone's whispering in your ear, it's a huge increase in the mouse signal versus everything bouncing around in the room. So my, my voice sounds nice and tight in the studio because I've removed a lot of the reverb or the reflections by having all this sound paneling around or sound damping around me. Versus if I took all this away, you'd hear that, that Zoom call conference room sound we all got accustomed to over COVID, right? So all that being said, reverb and reflections can cloud the data, but it's inevitable and moving closer will usually get you better data but it doesn't necessarily mean you need to run your pink noise super hot to get over that because it is a linear relationship. 
if I have pink noise exciting a room by getting it louder, it doesn't mean that I'm going to reduce the reverb. The more energy going into the room, it's a linear relationship. So we're going to get the same amount of reverb back. So what we need to overcome is noise. So which leads us to our fun little experiment here. So my measurement setup here is my microphone, which is about a foot away from this speaker, and it's getting the signal generator output from Smart. So it's running a pink noise out, and that's my measurement loop, is the my audio interface running directly into the speaker, into the microphone, back in, and that's our measurement. Our reference is a digital loopback of that same pink noise source. What I have here is this speaker's twin, the same distance from the microphone, but it's getting fed pink noise from my sound bullet. So it's the same exact source, but completely decorrelated. It's a different random number generator of pink source. And so it's going to be the same, uh, basically, propagation path and the same signal type, but completely different from that one since it's not being generated at the same time synchronously. So we're going to use it to linearly cloud the data and see what that looks like and see at what levels that makes sense. Here in Smart, I've calibrated my microphone so you can hear me talk. I'm, so it's about 65-ish dB at the loud parts. So SPL A weighting on slow. So let's take a measurement of this speaker alone and see what that level is at. And then we'll start to play with it and see what the data looks like. So this is solo of our main speaker. I've got it sitting right here and it, let's look at what the SPL data was. It's basically 67.7 dBA on slow is where uh, the, the level is at. That's what I'm paying attention to up here. Now let's selectively add noise at 20 dB below what we measured, at 10 dB below, 60 dB below, and equal, and see what that's doing to our measurement. So now I'm going to kick on this other speaker, and we'll measure it. So if we're at 67.7, let's go to 47.7. And now let's take another measurement. So I'm calling this one 20 dB offset and let's see the change of coherence. So this was our reference now with no noise and we see just a little drop in the top end. Now let's make a 10 dB difference. So if we were at 67.7, we need to go to down, down to 57.7. Now we're here, let's take another measurement. So now there's a 10 dB offset between signal and noise. Now let's go to 6 dB. Second measurement. Now let's go for equal level. Let's take a measurement. Now let's take a look at the data and draw some conclusions. The yellow trace now, I've, I've recolored these and put them in a different order, is our solo main speaker, it is our reference. 
So if I apply a little bit of offset here and raise it up, we see here at a 1 24th octave weighting, that's what it looked like. And we see since I have this trace selected, this is the coherence trace we're seeing. Again, very, very high. Now, here is a copy of itself added 20 dB below. Again, it's just a very, very slight drop in coherence and level. Now let me go to our minus 10 dB. We see compared to the other, it's the coherence has dropped broadband over a little bit. Again, let's see just how much. Most of it's hanging out around, I'd say 90%, which with the math checks out. So as long as we have a 10 dB difference between signal and noise, we still have a 90% coherence. Again, which compared to that real world data that I showed you, it was all over the place due to all the reverb. So the thing is, you really don't need to be that much higher than the noise floor to get there, which is pretty cool. Now let's move on to six decibels. And we see again, the coherence has dropped broadband overall. And we can see that the, the trace is actually getting more jagged. That means there's more ripple in it because it's having a hard time parsing out what's signal and what's noise. And then at equal level, we see the coherence is again, all over the map. And we see it hang out around 50% because it's equal part signal, equal part noise. So what can we gain from this? When we're running our signal generator in the field, we really don't need to have it that screaming loud. We're not shooting for a specific SPL level. Again, I was running at 67 dB. The noise floor in most arenas is higher than that with the air conditioning and the forklifts and all that stuff's going on. We don't need to shoot for that. So how can you make sure you are appropriately above the noise floor in the field? And let's test that. So if you hop over to Spectrum View in Smart, I have my microphone here and I got one third octave banding and stop talking and ha let things sit. So we can see here down in this low mid range, we have the air conditioning, the road noise outside, all that stuff hovering here. And that top of it is hanging out around, in my case, it looks like uh, at max negative 60 full scale as it breaks apart this waveform and displays it across here. What does it look like in the top end? The noise floor is way down at <laughs> negative 87. So it's a 20 dB difference again, because there's not a lot of high frequency swimming around in here naturally. It's just the low frequency seeping in from outside and the air conditioning. So all that being said, only need to get 10 dB, 10 dB above this noise floor <laughs> to get there. So let's see what it looks like in spectrum view if I kick back on my signal generator and this speaker. This was at 67 dBA. Again, I could, it's a little bit louder than I would want to if I have a conversation, but I am miles above the noise floor here. So I only have to worry any given frequency range, as long as I'm at least 10 dB above, I can really be sure that my coherence is gonna be good. Again, we have to deal with the reverb of the room we're in, that is a separate issue, not controllable by the overall signal level, but I only have to run my signal generator loud enough to get above the noise floor so that I can get good data. So I could actually run this really, really, really low. And let me demonstrate Demonstrate that and then we'll wrap up. So going back to transfer function, I'm going to hide all these traces, bring the microphone back, turn on my signal generator. And we see my measurement here. I'm going to br slowly bring down the pink noise generator that's linked at the hip between my measurement and reference way, way down. And we're going to see the SPL level drop and we're going to see it stay constant for a long time since I'm so far above the noise floor. So hanging out about 50 dBA without me talking. We can see the, the coherence drop because of my voice. Now with it, this low is having a hard time putting the data together because the signal's so close to the noise. So it's not sure, let me get a little bit higher.
So I was able to do it at 49 dBA, which is crazy. Again, it's a very low noise environment. The absolute SPL does not matter. It has incredibly high coherence at 49 dBA here in my studio. All right, what are our key takeaways here? Pink noise is a broadband random signal that excites the entirety of our sound system. It's ranges from 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000 hertz. We want to excite them all so we can see them all in our measurement software. Pink noise sounds flat to our ears. We use coherence as a quality indicator of the integrity of the data we are capturing. Very low coherence means the software that we're using is not really sure if this is signal or noise. Higher coherence means higher signal to noise and lower coherence means low signal to noise. This could be either a bad measurement setup, AKA we're doing something wrong with the measurement loop. It could be affected by the, the noise in the room or in your measurement or within electronics you're measuring, or it could be a bad reverb to signal ratio. So we can move the microphone closer to the source, just like getting closer to somebody who's whispering in our ears can be more intelligible than being at the back of an arena with someone trying to shout. Again, it's not about the absolute SPL level, but if you're looking for a reference, you should be able to run your signal generator at a conversational level and still be able to get good quality data. And you may be asking yourself, well, don't I have to crank up the mic preamp on my interface to be able to get the signal coming in at a decent level? Yes, you will. And that's fine. Your preamps are not noisy more often than not, unless it's a really, really cheap, crappy interface. Um, but most stuff these days, including my Evo 8 here, I have another video, which I'll link below. I crank it up 50 dB. And here today, you saw it at 45 dB of gain added to it, and there's zero difference in the quality of the measurement. So do not be afraid to crank up you, the, the gain on your microphone. Just make sure if you have an interface that has the direct monitoring button, please do not send a microphone gained up that hot through your PA. All right, hope this is helpful to you to uncovering how you can actually run your signal generator lower at shows so the lighting department won't be mad at you because they can't talk about uh, DMX addresses <laughs> over your tuning strategy. Anyway, my name is Michael Curtis. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I uh, would love to talk measurement more with you in future videos. I'll catch you next time.